Okay, did you see the posters this week around the town? Thank you, Thomas. Marvellous. <laughs> hey, well done, Caleb. Okay. They've been up, and while I was ill in bed, Matthew and Caleb took a couple of hundred invitations out and so on. They all got louts. And um, I discovered a new phrase anyway in the course of the week. Lager louts, saga louts, okay? Um, and perhaps one or two people on Twitter who saw the posting of this stuff, they thought, ooh, what's that? And, oh, very nice, you know. One of the lads from Ammonford sort of um, ministers there tweeted, oh, very good, I see what you've done there, That's, you know, like that. I had to say, well, actually, it's, um, it's not original. It comes from a 2007 psychology paper, an academic paper, and uh, you'll see it in a minute. Did you spot the emphasis there on louts? Well, you must have done. What is a lout? A lout is an uncouth and aggressive man or boy, according to the Oxford Dictionaries, uh, Cambridge Dictionary, a young man who behaves in a very rude, offensive, and sometimes violent way. Do you spot the emphasis there on youth? It has historically been a term of disapproval used by the older person against the misguidance of the stronger passions of youth. Should we put it like that? Hmm, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah? But in more recent times, what's happened is the term has been turned back a little bit on the elderly. We've had this development of the, the concept of the saga lout, the elderly person, stroppy, looking for a fight and drinking too much. The typical saga lout, and this is from that psychological paper I was talking about, the typical saga lout is retired, developed a taste for drinking at home in the 1960s and 1970s, and now has enough spare income to splash out on their favourite tipple every night. Quite a problem, says Dr Peter Rice, who is a consultant psychiatrist at Sunnyside Royal Hospital Montrose. He reckons that the, uh, the young and their drinking habits is improving, but the old and theirs is not. It's going in the other direction. And he says, the term I've used to capture the issue is saga lokes. The point I'm trying to establish is that human disorderly conduct can apply to all sorts of individuals. It varies in the way it comes out from individual to individual, but all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and are put right with God again by his grace, through the redemption that comes through Christ Jesus, okay? So that's a big issue. God can turn louts into leaders regardless of their age, whether they're lager louts, saga louts, or actually quite nice people. Okay. Near the beginning of his gospel, Jesus called his first followers. Can you imagine Jesus on Twitter? He wouldn't be very good with 12 followers, would he? But he takes 12 followers, unlikely candidates, and with those 12, which would never do you any good on Twitter, those 12 followers, he changes the world. At the beginning of this gospel, then Jesus called his first disciples, chapter 1, 16 to 20. And, and the second section now of his gospel, he goes back to that group, in Mark's gospel, he goes back to that group and he picks out 12 of those that are already following him. He's only got his followers to choose from, for those who will be their leaders. Notice that huge statement that starts off this section about who Jesus is. Jesus went up the mountain and called for those he wanted, and they came to him. Now that's not a mountain in Galilee, and there's a reason for that. Jesus went up a mountain, and he called... 12 leaders. Can you think of anything like that happening in the Old Testament? Because time and again in this process, Jesus is kicking off, hitting buttons in the Old Testament knowledge of the people who are going to be reading this, encountering this experience. See, the man who went up a mountain in the Old Testament, very famously, and called to him the 12 leaders of Israel was Moses, the lawgiver. And he went up Sinai, that mountain there, and he gave them the law. And all this time, the Jewish people have been expecting the return of a prophet like Moses to save his people. And, and then... Jesus does that. He casts himself in that role. He goes up this mountain and he calls to him. And how many does he call? He calls 12. Very provocative on the part of Jesus to choose 12 
because he's already signaled a radical break with Judaism in chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, talking about new cloth on old garments, new wine in old bottles. This is going to be something radically new. And he was understood perfectly clearly then that he was having to go and separate from Old Testament Judaism because the Jewish leaders were so enraged they set out to do away with him from that point onwards, didn't they? They knew what was going on. Jesus is saying, I am scrapping your precious religion and I'm casting myself in the significant role as the new Moses who comes to bring you the new covenant with God. And now I'm setting up 12 leaders of the new Israel. Beginning of his ministry, Jesus spent 40 days in the desert. Looks like an illusion to Moses going up the mountain to receive the law from God. And to the Israelites, 40 years in the wilderness wandering around. And now he chooses 12 apostles to be the new heads over the newly constituted, new covenant people of God. That's going to crop up again in chapters 11 to 13. You know, the fig tree getting cursed, destruction of the temple, end of the world. Okay, so now, the followers. He calls 12 to be with him. Five we've met already. Uh, Jesus went along the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea. You're a fisherman. Follow me, he said. I'll make you fishers of men. Remember that? Yeah? And then, going a little bit further down the beach, he sees another fishing firm, bigger one, more prosperous. James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, in their boat, mending nets, called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. See, it's a bigger business. They've got staff. And they followed him. And then as he went along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, because he's a tax collector, and he says, follow me. Fishermen and tax collectors who were at one another's throats because the tax collector was levying the tax on the fish being exported. It was an excise tax. So we've got the five already. We've got Simon, Andrew, James, John, and Levi. Seven more names. What sort of people does he choose? for that significant historic role, leaders of the New Covenant people of God. Why do you think that might be? How does he achieve turning that lot into the leaders of the people of God? Well, Simon Peter. Let's just see what sort of people he picks up. Who? Simon Peter. What do we know about Peter? Fisherman. We're not talking Robson Green and his extreme fishing. We're talking more like Grimsby Trawlerman. What sort of guy is he going to be? Well, we also know he's, he's loud, first to pipe up, always. He's always loud. He's the one who gets on your wick, isn't he? He's the one who's always got something to say. Peter. Assertive. Assertive to the point that later on he's going to actually turn and rebuke Jesus. As Jesus predicts his future and the future of salvation. Assertive. Pushy. I want to come to you on the water, Lord. You again, Peter. You know? That kind of guy. Arrogant. Though everybody else deserts you, I will never leave you. Yeah, three times. Listen to the cockerel. And a brawler. Because even after having three years intensive training, there they are in the garden. Jesus is betrayed into the hands of men, as he said he would be. Along comes a servant of the high priest to take Jesus away. And Peter is carrying a weapon. And he pulls it out and he chops off the ear of the high priest's servant. That's going to do a lot of good, isn't it? He's a brawler. Not a nice guy. He carried a sword and he'd use it. Even after three years with Jesus, Peter is still a bit of a yob. No wonder Jesus has given him the nickname Rocky Peter. He's still a bit of a yob. You know what he's going to do, though, don't you? He's going to be the guy who preaches the first sermon on Pentecost. He's going to be the guy in Acts 10 who opens up the church on the, to the Jewish, non-Jewish world. He's going to be the guy who heads up the church of Jerusalem in the early days, when there are thousands crowding through the doors. God is making this arch job into a really strong leader. And then there's his sibling, his brother there, Andrew. Not a great deal known about Andrew. His name in Greek means manly or brave. Possibly not a pillar of the Sunday school. Disciple of John the Baptist, apparently, according to John's Gospel. He's the one who told Jesus about the boy with the loaves and fishes. 
But then beyond that, we don't know much about him. We get off into legend. Apparently, he preached in Scythia, which is not an easy place. And he preached along the Black Sea and the Dnieper River as far as Kiev. And from there, he traveled to Novgorod. Now, this is in the days when that is wild stuff. According to tradition, he founded the Sea of Byzantium in AD 38. So he's off in hard places doing tough stuff, planting churches, and is said to have been martyred by crucifixion at the city of Patras, nailed to a Latin cross. Tradition develops he was, he was crucified on a, a cross going the other way, you know, like that instead of like that. Um, just don't, don't know. We're off into tradition. These guys are fishermen. They are rough diamonds, and they're made into leaders in the new covenant kingdom of God. They're not smooth guys. They're tough guys. They're rough guys. They're not the guys we'd pick to be our pastor. The men who worked with their hands, they brawled, and they obviously did the wrong thing a lot. Jesus turned lights into leaders. Keeping them company, in those early days, James and John. James and John with their father Zebedee and their hired men, Posh, in their boat. And these two boats, we know, were the star terms of their Sabbath school class. They were not. They weren't known in the village as the sons of the covenant. They were known in their village, not as the sons of encouragement, but as the sons of thunder. And yet we know that at the end of his life, there's John, the apostle, you know, a pillar of the church in Ephesus as an old man. Uh, the picture of him we're given is him standing up and encouraging people to love one another. He's known as the apostle of love in his older days because he's walked with God. He's lived with Jesus. Jesus turns louts into leaders. No self-respecting rabbi would have had people like these in his entourage. We don't know that much about them. They just went off into obscurity and did amazing things and planted churches in strange places. Uh, Philip. Where did Philip go? I forget where Philip went. Um, he's, got, he's got this Greek name that means lover of horses. Huh? <laughs> What's that about? Is he on the GGs or something? I don't know. Uh, Matthew, Levi, the tax collector. Now we know what he's like. He's collaborating with the Roman authorities. He's, he's in with the bunch of sinners. He's in the worst possible dinner parties, you know? dinner party. Thomas. We know Thomas went off into India and evangelized India. There are still Christians in India who, who owe their origins way, way back to Thomas. All these guys laying down their lives for Christ. As tradition and history such as we have it tells us. Bartholomew. Just not to be left out. Um, it seems that Bartholomew was a bit of a son of the sod, really. He was a plowman. Uh, Bartholomew is derived from Aramaic, which means the son of the furrow. So they're not all fishermen, you know, there's a bit of balance in here, there's a bit of agriculture, but he's a guy who made his living following oxen and ploughs through the hard dirt of Palestine. These are the sort of guys that Jesus is calling to himself. These are the sort of guys that he takes and uses to be the leaders of the new covenant people. James, the son of Alphaeus, also known as James the Less. James, Jesus turns less people into leaders as well. That's quite comforting, isn't it? Thaddeus. It means large-hearted, courageous. Don't stand too close to him at a drinking session with the boys. He's a big, hard lad again, isn't he? Simon the Zealot. What do we know about Simon the Zealot? He was a zealot. What does that mean? There were um, Jewish terrorists going around in this sort of time, revolting against Rome. There was a bunch out there known as the Sicarii, named after their swords, the little, little short daggers called Sicai. And the Sicarii would go around and they'd, they'd wait till there was a big public sort of assembly and stuff and the Romans were about and they'd just slip up to a Roman in the crowd, stab him and slip away. They're nice guys. Simon the Zealot. Alongside Matthew the tax collector, Levi the tax collector. So here's this guy who's from a Levite family, you know, supposed to be proper pucker Jewish boy, and he's gone over to the Romans, and here's this guy who goes around, you know, 
popping off Romans. And Jesus calls this lot together to be the leaders of the new covenant people of God. Do we really expect to have our sort of people in church? Because that's not the model Jesus gives us at all. Take these and makes out of these louts into leaders, louts who listen. Because last in the list, there comes the final one who didn't listen. Judas Iscariot, he betrayed him. Jesus knew what he was doing. He didn't throw him out. Jesus knew what he was doing with the money bag, resisting the preaching of the kingdom. Jesus knew he'd been liaising with the enemy to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus doesn't always turn all louts into leaders. Only the ones who listen. Judas was the one who handed over Jesus. And the difference lies in whether these louts are listening and being led by the heartbeat of Jesus. So where have we got to? Who? That's the sort of people. What? What does he call them to? What does he call leaders of the new covenant people of God to? He calls them to himself. He goes up the mountain. He calls to himself these guys so that they would be with him and he could send them to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. Jesus has picked the unlikely to reach out to the unexpected. But what exactly are they commissioned to do for him? The first thing is that those who will serve him are first and foremost to be his companions. They're going to serve him first and foremost to be with him. To be his companion. Now there are so many things that can knock that off balance that can make that go awry. This is not a profession you see. It's not like the, 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 the rabbis had their disciples and the way they were running all this sort of stuff, where the thing is that, that you, you learn and you know facts which you regurgitate, the way the Pharisees had that all going on, with qualifications and reputation ascribed to mortal men. It's nothing like that. This ministry is primarily a relationship, not to, but with the Lord who has called you. It's a relationship with, not to. And so much of our thinking says it's a relationship to you know, I have been put right with God because these boxes have been ticked. No, no, it's a relationship with, because when the boxes are ticked, it brings me into a relationship with him, and that has impact on my life. Is that making sense? It's a relationship with. Time with Jesus himself is the primary effect of the gospel having happened to you, and it is the primary point of their calling. Because from that time with him, everything they need to know will be learned. Every example they need to, be fo to follow will, will be set to them. And every attitude and disposition of the heart that they need to demonstrate will be caught from him. Does that make sense? The primary thing that Jesus calls us to is to be with him. Now that's... That's so important. Why is that important? How can such culpable inactivity as spending time with God be justified? Surely you should be doing things. We all fall into that way of thinking. Why is that the answer? Well, go back to the source of the human problem. Take a minute to work the thing through. What is the source of the human problem? Humanity and the cosmos, the chaos began when our humanity, built to be lived in fellowship with God, ceased to be lived out in fellowship with God. That's where the source of all the havoc happened. Yeah? Back in that garden, apples were preferred to obedience. Yeah? And fellowship with God was lost. Humanity threw its little toddler tantrum with God and broke things. And from that fundamental breakdown in relationship from that sprang not just our personal but our communal physical emotional psychological spiritual chaos and from that the creation's chaos ran alongside our individual chaos our fundamental human experience of alienation then in, in a world we were made to steward and care for, that alienation arises from and out of our fundamental alienation from God at that moment of tantrum. So, God's solution to this fundamental human experience 
of alienation is to pour out his life to mend the relationship. And it is as the relationship is mended that the new world is built. Does that make sense? Functionally, not theoretically. See, we're evangelicals. There's a problem. We, we do this theoretically. Yes, I've ticked the boxes and therefore I'm right with God. No, it's a relationship not to, but with. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Here are the ungodly guys. We've looked at the list. Here we all are together as well today. Okay? Ungodly. And what's happened is that Christ has died for the ungodly so that we can be with him. That's the thing. That's the mending thing. If you want to mend this broken cosmos, you've got to mend the fundamental thing that went wrong. And there it is. The first thing that they should be with him. So that they would be with him. Because that's the mending of what went wrong at the fall. And that's the beginning to address again the chaos that arises out of that disrupted relationship. Let's be with him. It's not all there is. But it's first. And it quite honestly, how can we adequately communicate this one? It quite honestly drives everything else. That is what drives everything else. To be with him. So that they could be with him and so that he could send them out to preach. <laughs> if you were running an organization, right, you wouldn't approach things this way, right? You wouldn't approach it like this. We don't spend time with Jesus for personal comfort. There are those who think that's the answer. And, it, you know, it, it's not. It's, you can't do that. He is God on a mission. And when you spend time with him, you get like him. His love is infectious. You spend time with him and he will send you out. And I can't say how far. And I can't say specifically to whom. And I can't say to spend time with whatever group, people group, location. I don't know. I can say that to spend time with him is normally a touch and go affair. You get close to his heart and it pushes you out to come back and go out. Uh, and the only thing I can think of is like a moon orbiting a planet. You come close to him and then you go on his mission. And you come close to him and you go on his mission. Does that make sense? Can you see that? There's an elliptical orbit there. General purpose of sending gets clear here though. He had them come to him so that he could send them to preach. Look at that picture. There it is. To preach. Apostello is the verb that's in use here. It's send them in order to preach. Now that, that's an English word to be watched when you, when you find that in an English Bible. What does it mean? You know well, because you've heard me say this time and again. In the original languages, there are lots of different words that are translated preach for us. Okay. What have we got here? The word we've got here is caruso. The kerux, kerux is a herald. And this means to be a herald. To be a herald. Here's the picture. Jesus comes as the king in Mark chapter 1 verse 15. He says the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. He's heralding the incoming kingdom of God. That is the fundamental statement in Mark. And as we've seen, the content is not spelled out after that because it's spelled out at the beginning. And, and you know, Peter and Mark, Peter behind Mark probably telling him, they only say some, something once, okay? That's enough. Once is enough. So the kingdom of God is at hand in his ministry and people should therefore all repent and believe the good news and express that by following him and becoming like him, fishers of men. He heralded his kingdom. And now he calls to himself the twelve, representing the twelve heads of the new Israel, who will now go out for him to herald his kingdom. That's the picture. You see that? There's a lot we may need to recapture from that to reform our ideas about how we share our faith. The herald spends time in the presence, in the court of the king, whose kingdom is coming in, in order to go out at his bidding to herald the incoming kingdom on his behalf. And it happens that all of these twelve, like the Old Testament patriarchs, are men, but there is nothing in scripture that says that isn't a female task. That one. Didasco, didaske, authoritative teaching office in the church, yes there is. That one, not. All of us to go out and herald. Primary function, be with him. Secondary function, herald the good news of his kingdom coming. Tell him. And then there's the third function. 
to have authority to cast out demons. The devil also has his horsemen. They affect and they afflict the lives of those unprotected by his blood. And there are people who need to be set free. And you see that in Jesus' ministry. You see it only, not only is it his ministry, you see it in the, in the ministries of the twelve he then sends out to do that. Passing on the heralding of the kingdom that's coming in to the ones who come next. And on down the cascading uh, leadership, if you like, and the history of the new covenant people of God. Here from the start, the twelve are set apart to militant mission in a hostile world where their proclamation will bring them to the point of engagement with the enemy of souls and the cohorts he sends out in his self-service. But his heralds carry the authority of the king and they go now to do his business in his service. Jesus did not send his followers out to be raving charismatics doing daft and unbiblical stuff, but he did send them out to engage with spiritual enemies that hold lost souls in the grip of the devil. And it's very difficult then, isn't it, to say, yeah, we want to be with him, yeah, we want him to send us out to preach, and then we're not prepared to take it on. Because there are three elements to this. How? Who? We've seen that. It's a scary thought. What a bunch of picks. Secondly, what? That's scary enough in itself, isn't it? To be with him, that's great. To go out and herald, that's scary. And then to go out and engage the enemy, that is scary, scary. But it's not, because it's going with him in his authority, in his service. How did he turn these guys, these louts he's got, into leaders who can do that stuff? How did he turn those louts into that sort of leaders? Here comes the biggest of all our questions. The thesis is that Jesus turns louts into leaders, right? And by the time Pentecost happens, they're not perfect, but the job of turning louts into leaders is, is complete. It, it just doesn't do justice to the evidence, though, to say that at Pentecost, well, God sat in heaven, lobbed the spirit at some useless, untrained individuals, and ping, like pouring water onto instant mash, there they were instantly transformed, they were ready-made leaders. It doesn't work like that, does it? He takes three odd years, and then he takes a third a lifetime with them spending time with him and being transformed. The way our God transforms character involves close encounter with Jesus. We've seen that already. He picked these twelve to be with him. Yeah? To be with him. Jesus taught and formed character through his fellowship. He called them up the mountain and he called them to become part of the new Israel. But what he called them to was a lifetime from that point onwards of being with him. They are to model the relationship that they will herald. Does that make sense? See, that's a Twitter sound, but isn't it? They are to model the relationship that they will herald. It's not just a message. Proclamation comes in the power of the Spirit as we model the relationship he creates. A new fellowship with him, a new function for him. Jesus taught and formed character through his fellowship, but Jesus taught and formed character through functioning in his calling. Paul picks this up, doesn't he, writing to Philemon, Philemon 1.6. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. How do, you, how do you get to the point of having a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ? Three years in Bible college. No. No. By being active in the sharing of your faith. And you see God at work. You learn his ways. You learn his character. You learn how he deals with people. You see and observe his operation. You build faith the same way you make apple strudel pastry. I didn't put that on Twitter. I should have done. You build faith the same way you make apple strudel pastry. You've seen that happen. I've seen it on the telly. I haven't seen it in our kitchen. I don't want to go there because that would make a terrible mess. It is messy. But what you do is you bang it around a bit. You chuck it in there and you throw it like this, don't you? You throw it and you spread it out and you like that. Yeah? You know what I mean, don't you? 
Tom's with me on this. You ladies are looking extremely dubious. Okay? That's what happens. You bang it around, you smash it around, you chuck it in the air a lot. And you catch it. How does God build faith? We get knocked around a bit, we get thrown up in the air, we get spread as thin as we possibly can, and then the most delightful things in the world, because I love apple strudel. You love apple strudel? Oh. That's how you build faith. That's how Jesus builds faith in these guys, by putting them in the function which pushes them, throws them up in the air, spreads them thin, always catches them. Adds a little fruit and a little spice. It's the only way to learn that the master always catches you. It's the way to build faith. They're called to fellowship with him. That's great. They're called to function for him. Apple strudel. And the question that sits in my mind is this. Why do we ever say anything to our churches, to our believers, young and old, other than, hey, look, learn this, go do it. Disciples, followers, leaders, churches that see God turns louts into leaders, they're going to be doing that. And that is our God-given calling. Look, there was worship, that was great. There was teaching, that was great. There was time they spent with Jesus. Yeah, fantastic. And so far, they're only fellowship Christians. You know what fellowship Christians are? No backbone, they're only still standing up because they're so close together, yeah? Jesus then said, out you go. We're going to build your faith like apple strudel. There's going to be dough in the air, lots of stretching and falling, sometimes mess on the floor. But there's the power of God and lost people are saved and the world is changed. To be with him. To go out from him. There is our calling. But now what? Time to make apple strudel.